You're in cruise over the Moab Desert at 36,000 feet when you see an object in front of you, but going 450 miles an hour, you don't even have time to exclaim before it smashes into the windshield. The NTSB has released their preliminary report on United Flight 1093 and we'll go over it on taking off. Hi, my name is Dan Milliken and I'm still on the road. I remember when this story broke on the news when it came out and it was reported that falling space debris had hit the window, being the first time space debris has hit a commercial airliner midair. But those with experience in aviation pointed to the higher likelihood of hitting a weather balloon. And it didn't take long before a photo comparing the base of a weather balloon to the shape of the exterior impact to change minds. The NTSB released a preliminary report on United Flight 1093 confirming the plane impacted a stray weather balloon over Utah. With this report, we'll get to see what happened in the cockpit from the captain's perspective, how the NTSB learned the object was likely a weather balloon, and even how the windows are designed to keep everyone safe on the plane. What the pilots experienced was crazy, and let's go over what they saw, what they did, and what happened according to the NTSB. All right, first, the pilots. UAL Flight 1093 rolled away from gate B46 at Denver International Airport, 5.51 a.m. Mountain Time, scheduled to arrive at LA International Airport about two hours later. The flight reached and maintained cruise altitude of flight level 360, 36,000 feet. In the interview with the NTSB, the captain stated that he looked out the window, noticing an object that was distant in the horizon, and before he could react and point out the object to his first officer, a loud boom and glass sprayed the pilots from the window in front of the first officer. The captain received lacerations to his arm from the glass, but amazingly, the FO was unharmed. There's no mention in the NTSB report on whether shorts needed changing. The pilots contacted air traffic control and began a descent, and the cabin pressure actually remained stable. Eventually, the captain transferred control of the plane to the first officer while he went through the related checklist and relayed information to dispatch and the flight attendants about what had just happened. After conferring with dispatch and looking at the situation, they decided to divert to Salt Lake City International Airport. And while the captain made the calls, the FO's window overheat light lit up and the crew followed the checklist for the window. And not long after, the passengers heard this over the intercom. Unfortunately, we've had bad news. The aircraft has collided with an object. We will be making an emergency landing at Salt Lake City International Airport. Then the captain cleaned his wounds, bandaged himself, and resumed flying the plane. UAL 1093 was cleared to land with an ILS approach to runway 16 left and had an uneventful touchdown. The airliner parked at gate B10 at Salt Lake City where the passengers got off and then boarded another plane and continued their journey to LAX. The pilot was the only one to receive any kind of injuries. And the NTSB did not travel to investigate this incident but did have the windshield removed and sent in for examination. All right, let's talk about the object they hit. After the event was reported, the NTSB requested data of positions of weather balloons, other aircraft, or known re-entry objects that were large enough to have significant portions survive the atmosphere re-entry that might have been in the area when the collision occurred. And at 36,000 feet, a drone was unlikely, unless it had been maybe a stray military one. People wondered if it was debris falling from space and a one in a million chance collision. Well, Windborne Systems, a weather balloon company based in Palo Alto, California, did report losing contact with one of their global sounding balloons, shortened to GSB in the report. And it launched from Spokane, Washington at 1129 Mountain Time the day before. The balloon floated from Washington south through Oregon and Nevada before it curved northeast into southern Utah. The balloon stopped transmitting data between 636 and 643 a.m. The last reported altitude was 35,936 feet, although it had oscillated between 35,800 to 36,200. Because this is an unmanned free balloon, this would not have been something that would have been in the charts that pilots look at uh, when they're prepping and doing their pre-flight. 
The free flight balloons like this would have a notum issued, that's notice to airmen, informing pilots about the activity. And the windborne weather balloon had a notum, GEG 10068, issued at 8.16 a.m. on October 15th that expired by 5 p.m. that same day. According to the FAA, operators of the unmanned balloon must post the flight on flight progress strips along the planned trajectory and revise routing as tracking reports require. And unless air traffic control requires otherwise, the unmanned balloon operators are required to monitor the balloon's position every two hours, but they are not forwarded to the operator unless ATC requests the data. Some operators equip their balloons with transponders and a radar reflection device, but at cruise altitude, the, a balloon transponder and the radar equipment often operate intermittently to conserve the balloon's battery power. As a pilot, I personally believe anything like this should have an ADSB out operating at all times, but the FAA currently does not require this. In terms of the design of the GSB, it's a, a system consisting of a balloon envelope filled with lift gas, an avionics flight control package, communications and sensing, and a ballast system for control. And Winborn described the balloons as being designed with the intent to minimize harm in the event of impact during flight or landing. The GSB is made with a thin plastic film, while the ballast is low density and low grain size. It would certainly explain the sanding effect on the metal just above the window, as well as the shape of the uh, most dented part there by the window. All right, and speaking of the windshield, during and after the impact, the plane did not lose pressurization, which is such a relief and speaks volumes to the design of the windshields for this kind of situation. The NTSB describes that the window is designed to withstand the flight and pressurization loads encountered during flight while providing visibility for the pilots. To achieve this, the window is made up of a thermally tempered glass pane, followed by a conductive heating film, a urethane layer, a vinyl inner layer, another urethane inner layer, and inside thermally tempered glass pane. The engineering is just incredible. The windshield is held in place by stainless steel Z-bar encased in a moisture seal. A coating on the outer windows helps improve the ability to shed water during rainy conditions. In order to protect the pilots, the windshields are certified to withstand the impact of a four pound bird without penetration and be capable of holding maximum cabin pressurization loads with the failure of a single pane and that the internal pane must be non-splintering. With that, the external pane is considered non-structural. The vinyl interlayer was a structural fail-safe pane, and the interior was the structural pane. So the, the window did its job to keep the flight safe and only minor injuries to the captain. And this incident reminds me of one of the most incredible window incidents ever in an airliner. It was June 1990 and British Airways Flight 5390, a BAC 111, similar to the DC-9 with two engines on the tail. They were going from Birmingham, England to Malaga, Spain, and the captain was 42-year-old Timothy Lancaster. Sitting in the right seat was 39-year-old First Officer Alistair Atch Little did they know that the window pane had been improperly installed. Atchison was the pilot flying and after a routine takeoff and getting to cruise, the pilots unbuckled their shoulder restraints and Lancaster loosened his lap belt. And they climbed through 17,300 feet and the cabin crew started prepping for meal service. And flight attendant Nigel Ogden was checking with the pilots and entering the flight deck when a loud boom happened, an explosive decompression. Suddenly, water was everywhere as the cabin filled with condensation. The left windshield, the one in front of the captain, was gone. And with it, Lancaster was sucked through the hole, his knees catching on the flight controls, his body outside exposed to the incredible wind, the cold, lack of oxygen. The flight deck door was blown inward, blocking the throttle as Atchison started an emergency descent. Without being able to pull back the throttle, the airplane picked up speed as it went down. Ogden lunged for the captain, grabbed his belt, and hung on. And with the noise, Atchison had trouble communicating with air traffic control. Ogden was losing his grip 
and another cabin crew uh, came in and, and helped out, holding on to the captain who was still stuck halfway outside, plastered against the outside of the cockpit. Atchison got the plane down and they made an emergency landing. They thought for sure the captain was, was gone, was dead. But Lancaster survived with frostbite, bruising, shock, uh, fractures to his right arm, his left thumb and right wrist. He later mentioned in a documentary that he purposely twisted his torso around to face the inside of the plane so he would be able to breathe, but eventually he lost consciousness. Ogden, in his rush to save the captain, suffered frostbite to his face and a dislocated shoulder. There were no other injuries. Investigators found that the, the windshield had been installed 27 hours before this flight, and the maintenance people had used the wrong screws. They were too small. Lancaster actually returned to flying in less than five months. Incredible for what he went through. Atchison continued to fly until he turned 65. And when I heard about this United flight, I immediately thought about this incredible story. And I'm glad the glass held on the United flight and that only minor superficial injuries to one person occurred, the captain. Chalk one up to proper engineering and equipment doing what it's supposed to do. Well, that's the preliminary report for Flight 1093. And while the NTSB continues to investigate this incident, a final report probably won't come for another year. And recommendations from the NTSB. One takeaway for me as a pilot is to always keep my head on a swivel to keep looking outside because you just never know. Also, I hope that the FAA uh, begins requiring ADSB out on these objects. With our technology today, it, it just makes sense. Yeah, sure, it's a one in a million chance that something like, like this will collide with an airliner, but we just don't need to take the chance. Windborne has made some steps. They are improving their ADS-B out to air traffic control, and they're taking other steps to make sure that their balloons, if they get away, uh, don't live in that, that uh, altitude range that the airliners like to travel. So good for Windborne for doing that, and we'll see what the FAA and the NTSB uh, decide to do in the future with this kind of stuff. All right, thanks for watching and thanks to our sponsors like Colton Mortgage. If you ever need a residential mortgage or a refi, go to coltontakingoff.com. It's run by a pilot. And also, please check out one of our latest videos on the channel here. Remember, superior judgment trumps superior skill. Take care.